Bonjour, Willy Mix, let's talk about Tierra Audio pre-amplifiers. Seven different preamps, seven different flavors. If you don't know me already, I'm Willy Mix. You can see a lot of stuff on the screen about that. And I work every day on analog gear, Neve preamp, SSL 4000G, tube preamplifiers, old, new, anyway. I'm used to that type of sound and that type of gear. And I hope that convinced you at least a little bit that you are in good company to talk about this kind of preamps to see if they are crap or if they are good. All right, let's see that now. Everything here was recorded through very clean preamps for my Ultra Audio Fuse interface. This is not the final mix, I had to uh, deactivate a lot of plugins in order for my computer to handle all that. But anyway, that would give you an idea. Alright, let's start right away with Salt. Salt on the lead vocal. Everyone dictates sometimes you really don't want to get stuck inside like dwelling in this membrane on our own, yeah. Nothing fancy about it, it's a very clean and clear signal booster, like a cloud lifter for example, or a Triton Fethead. Nothing too fancy to say about it, it works, it gets the job done. Now let's switch to Pepper. Pepper, they say zero coloration, but I kind of disagree, it has a little bit of color. I will let you listen to it on the snare so you can hear what it does. So in my opinion, it has a little bit of a coloration in the high mids happening, a little bit like an API 512C in a way. And it also clips in a very analog way, but it clips and it's very obvious, for example, here. I guess you could hear that it's quite noticeable the way it clips on the snare wall, especially. It was maybe a bit too much in that sense. But if you're familiar with recording on an analog desk, it kind of clips in a similar way. It means that it shaves off the peaks in a very nice way. It's not something like digital clipping. It's very nice actually. But I also used it on the background vocals because it got some coloration in the high mid. I will let you listen to that. We could say that it has some kind of openness in a high mid in a way, some little bit of saturation maybe. And this has been recorded with the Shure SM7B, which is not a very bright microphone, so it really helps for that. That's also why I used it on these other background vocals that you're going to listen to it now. Yeah, I can hear that coloration in a high mid, but you might wonder how can I spot that on my end of the screen because you're not familiar with the audio fuse, artery audio fuse preamps. And for that, I will make you listen to the overheads, which had been recorded clean with a pair of U87s, and you will see the difference in coloration it has. I hope it will help you at least a little bit. And now let's listen to the snare in comparison. So as you can hear, the snare got a little bit more snap, a little bit more life to it actually. And it's thanks to the clipping that it's doing. That's why they call soft compression. But to me, it's like, clipping when you push into it and I really like it for snare or other similar instruments like this. Next to Pepper we've got Mint. Mint is very special. It's got some kind of high-end saturation to it. It's softened the low end a little bit. It has a very specific sound in my opinion. And actually Mint is the perfect description here in my opinion because when you're eating Mint it's a bit spicy in a way and it gets to your nose. It's a little bit peppery sometimes but not too much either. So it's close to pepper, but it's brighter. I've got a few examples with mint here, like for instance on the acoustic guitar, the one on the left has been recorded with mint on one of its microphones, and it sounds like this. I used the same microphones on both of these guitars, but different inline flavor preamps. So I will solo one so you can hear the difference it makes.
we haven't started to talk about Cocoa yet, but you can probably start to hear the difference between both preamplifiers there. Mint has got that high mid saturation that is very useful in a mixing scenario, but that's going to be the subject of another video, obviously. Now let's jump on Vanilla. Vanilla softened the high end in a very, I would say, Jamie Roquai virtual insanity way, if that makes sense to you, almost tape like. And it's something that works very well on background vocals. For instance, on these background vocals where I used an SM58, and it's actually the setup I have at the moment SM58 into vanilla into my interface. All right, let's listen to it and listen to how the high end is quite smooth and relaxed. Yeah, it's very soft and smooth. They say creamy sound. Yeah, slightly warm also can make sense in a way, even if it's a buzzword. Anyway, it's very useful to use also on more high pitch falsettos vocals like here, for example. It works great, in my opinion. That's also why I used it on lead vocals when it was in the higher register, which is usually quite harsh and compressed. Yeah, something like this, where it's very high, it needs to tame a little bit the high mids, and that's why I use vanilla, for example. I also used it on the synth on the Descartes stream that we have here, and it sounds like this. It's very atmospheric, though. It really helped to tame the high resonances you can get from synths. That's also why I used it on the lead guitar and it sounds like this. Yeah, it sounds very cool. It can make it sound softer and a bit more enjoyable to listen to without some high mid spikes and resonances. And it also can make your guitar sound fatter if you combine it with another inline preamp like Cocoa, for instance, which is exactly what I did on these rhythm guitars. Yeah, you can get that very big coloration and big low end and high end control from your guitar. That's probably why I used it here. And it's also probably one of my favorite flavors out of the bunch. It's not my favorite, the top one, but it's one of my favorites. Really like it for that. Next to that, we have chili. Chili is hot, obviously. And it's a saturation that can distort very easily, very noticeably. It can make everything you record very upfront and present because it's very saturated, but if you are not uh, giving it too much level, it won't saturate in a very obvious way, but will make everything sound intense and on the edge of breakup, which is great on like, for example, the first verse of a vocal when it's sung very low and quietly. It really helps to give it some kind of intimacy. The fever down south has been rising again and yet nobody wants. So it's soft, but it has that intensity to it. And if you keep on singing like that, but with a little bit more intensity, you will start to hear the saturation and even the distortion. I will let you listen to it. The hunter's desire to hunt down for the drive of a cold body lies down his innocence. Here we could probably hear the saturation of chili on the drive word when I'm singing drive. Drive of a cold body. Which is pretty nice actually, even if it's a little bit too much. Body lies. But in context. The 
So that's the kind of sound it can give you, but it's also very useful on acoustic guitars, like here, for example. So I used Chili on the Sennheiser 421, which by itself sounds a little bit mid-rangey, but helps to give some presence to the guitar in comparison to the 451 and the U87 that I used also on this acoustic guitar. Yeah, I really like using this super hot saturated preamp on very delicate parts because it gives them a super present and upfront feel. I also did the same thing on this guitar, for example. Well, it's not very a super delicate part, but it helps the sound to give a little bit more personality, even if there I might say that I was a little bit overboard on it, but doesn't matter, in the mix it sounds fine. And I used it also on this first guitar. So yeah, Chile to use with caution, but it adds a lot of personality and attitude to the sound. I really like that, especially when you're using very clean preamplifiers for an interface like I did here. Which leads me to Cocoa. Cocoa is probably my top one in the flavors preamps because it has a Carn Hill transformer inside, which gives it a very big low end, which is great for recording bass, kick drum, even electric guitars, but also for mixing, which is going to be the subject of another video, as I said earlier. It can clip pretty easily, so make sure that you get your gain staging right with this one. But also, in my opinion, in terms of transformer sound, it has the most obvious, the most characteristic sound of a transformer, which I'm used to have with all the analog gear I've got here in the studio. That's also why it's my favorite, even if the gain staging can be a bit tricky sometimes. So the obvious example for using Cocoa in a recording scenario will be a kick drum. That's why I used it on the kick drum and it sounds like this. As you can hear, it has a big bottom end and it's just an AKG D12 outside of a kick drum. So nothing too fancy with sub kick mics or whatever just a simple microphone facing the kick drum. That's why I really like Cocoa. I also obviously used it on bass and on bass it sounds like this. You can probably recognize that low end signature that I've got also on the kick drum but on the bass this time. I really like that and that's also why I used it on this tremolo guitar for example. Or on the first one. Or on the rhythm guitar as I said earlier. Which make it sounds huge and also on the acoustic guitars as I said earlier. And on the acoustic guitar, we can probably talk about what I said earlier, the gain staging with Cocoa, which is crucial. Because as you can hear, it makes it sound very intense because it adds a lot of saturation. It can start to clip the peaks and stuff like that. So make sure that the gain staging is right because it's easy to get too much of it. I also used it on the Moog Little Fatty and it sounds like this. So you might wonder why I use Cocoa on this one instead of Vanilla, because it tames the high end too, but also I used the Moog's uh, Little Fatty to create that big low endy pad in the last chorus, which sounds like this.
it's great to make uh, these kind of things sound massive and big. And it's also very nice uh, trick or tips or whatever you call it to uh, use in your song, especially when it's an acoustic tune to make it sound bigger to use this type of stereo big sub like that and Cocoa really helps to make them bigger than what they really are actually. I also used it on background vocals to give them a lot of intensity. This kind of color can help to tame these very harsh and nasally type of vocals. I also did the same thing here for example. The fever comes down and the fever comes down. You can hear the nice presence it has. It's a little bit like chili, but less mid-rangey and aggressive. It's actually if you mix vanilla and chili together and make them sound bigger. It's how I feel Cocoa sounds. And that's why I used it also on these vocals, for example. And the fever comes down. And the fever comes down. How we're talking about gain staging and you can hear the clipping here, for example. And the fever comes down. And the fever comes down. So yeah, that's a bit too much, I agree. But at least you can hear how it tames the S's. Listen to the S's, how quiet they are. And the fever comes down. And there is no DSR on the track, no DSR plugin. And the fever comes down. And the fever comes down. So it does tame the SS indeed. That's true. Oh, I just noticed you can also listen to Chili on a very high pitch vocal, and it sounds like this. And the fever comes down. I like that kind of saturation. It reminds me a little bit of when you push some solid states preamp and the fever comes down and the fever comes down and the fever comes down that's about it for chili and cocoa cocoa I could stay for hours on it it's my favorite i really wish i could have two of them so i could use them on the mix bus or the drum bus maybe but that's a subject for another video the one about mixing now let's jump on truffle so in my opinion truffle could be named jalapeno because it's a very hot distorted sound it's almost like a distortion pedal but i also understand why they name it truffle because if you used it on very subtle and delicate stuff like I used chili on, for example, it's going to give it a lot of harmonics, a lot of presence and a lot of very good stuff out of it. It also adds a bit of noise, which is logical when you realize how much gain it adds, but it's also very nice on these softer passages. I would let you listen to it here. The deepest mind of a young Okay, that's not very quiet, but it helps you to listen to this saturation. The deepest mind open your eyes. It's obviously saturated, but it's a nice saturation. I like it. It's an analog saturation, and I really like how it's done. But I also liked Truffle on the drone guitars here because it brings a lot of intensity. I will let you listen to it. It's very soft and very nice, but listen to it when it starts to build up and create that big saturation. Yeah, I love it. And I also used it on synths before, but not in this song, but it's very good on synths too. But here we're going to talk about truffle on acoustic guitar, which sounds like this. So 
so it doesn't distort here and it's actually because I played very quietly and with the fingers so it makes it very subtle and delicate and it adds a lot of harmonics but if you listen very closely you can hear a little bit of the saturation here yeah on this note we can hear the saturation here, even if it's subtle, but it also adds a lot of sustain. If you look at the waveform here, you will see how much sustain it has after the peak. And that's thanks to Truffle adding a lot of harmonics, compression, and that's something that I haven't seen a lot of people talking about. And it's actually one of the greatest features in Truffle, in my opinion. Yes, I really like it on this type of soft and delicate instrument. It gives them a lot of sustain. That's very cool. That's also why it's very useful during mixing. But that's going to be the subject of another video. Talking about another video, we are coming to the end of this one. I'm going to recap a little bit while I think about these Tier Audio preamp. First, what I really like about them is the fact that they offer a lot of color, which makes the recording process more interesting if you got an interface. And also the color that they had is not something like it just had a bit of top and a bit of bottom or whatever. It's actually very nice and reminds me a lot of the analog gear I'm using here in the studio. So it's definitely not toy-ish, something very interesting and useful. And it's also affordable in my opinion. It goes from 130 to 250, I think, pound maximum, which is not a lot if you want to add uh, some flavors to your uh, preamp that you already have without breaking the bank and buying a Neve 1073 clone, which is sometimes not as good even as the original one. So it's a bit of a scam in a way. But that's another subject. I also really like the ethics they got. They got an ethics about ecology and everything that's implied in there. You can check their website if you want to see that. This video is not sponsored by them, by the way. I'm just saying check the website because they're going to talk about it better than me, obviously, because they know their shit. And now what I would like to see in this tier audio preamp will be, for instance, an input trim. That would be insane if they had like a small screwdriver, like the one you can find in effect pedals, that would make them so great. Because sometimes I had to use two pad attenuation, which means 40 dB of attenuation going into Cocoa, for example, when recording electric guitars. Otherwise, it was clipping in a very obvious way. And they are great to use with synthesizers because with the output of the synthesizer, you can dialing the right amount of saturation because you can level the way you enter into uh, these inline preamps but with electric guitar snare or the acoustic instruments you can't and it's a bit of a shame because the sweet spot is great but you need to uh, you need to reach for it sometimes or you need to to attenuate the signal to get there and also some people say that they are a bit noisy it's true for truffle in my opinion truffle is a bit noisy but it's not the kind of noise i dislike it sounds like well, it's analog noise so it's not that problematic but obviously if you're recording neoclassical you won't take truffle it makes no sense to expect something to be clean if it's labeled as super distorted and expect it to be noise free because everything that is distorted in analog most of the time is quite noisy it makes sense but it's true that it could be less noisy but that's not a big problem for me but that's something that i had to tell you anyway i hope you really like that video if you have any questions you can ask me i will answer to it and i hope i will see you i mean see you yeah i hope you will watch my next video about the tierra audio flavors preamp but in a mixing scenario because i really like using them during mixing Anyway, in the meantime, have fun and au revoir.